Okay. Okay. Am I audible now? Shall I start? Yes, Krishna. Anantha Krishna, shall we start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, friends, uh, please come back. We are starting the session. Uh, don't worry about the question paper, answers, PowerPoint presentation. Already one round it has gone. Again, it will be posted today. Uh, that is, uh, people who want it, uh, that is, you can keep in touch with Mr. Anantha Krishna. He is coordinating the program. Uh, he is uh, an officer from uh, Technological Man and uh, he also a regional secretary in uh, Chennai R01. And you can also post me. I have given my number already, my WhatsApp number as well as, as well as the mobile number. So we will make available and nothing to worry. And uh, today evening, uh, so maybe in the afternoon, I will be posting two question papers other than this test one and test two, two question papers on circular based questions. Okay, circular based questions. There may be around 80, 90 circulars I have shortlisted from the 855 or 860 circulars issued by Canada Bank so far. So I have shortlisted maybe uh, that is 80, 90 circulars. Based on that important questions I have prepared, I will make available the question paper to you through Mr. Anantha Krishnan as well as people who are in my group also, I will make available. So that you have ample time now, maybe two weeks, three weeks, go back from the branch, you go through the circular, download the circulars, keep it, or you have a can write application now, app now, from the house also you can, act, because when we were officers, managers, we did not have the, the this benefit, go through the answers for these things from the circular, because these are all the only, not the questions that will be asked from the circular, some other questions also will be asked from the circulars. These 80, 90 circulars, if you are go through, maybe at least 20 questions you will get from them in the examination. So. Uh, these questions I will make available. There are circular based question paper one, circular based question paper two. Both the questions are available. I will, I will make available. So that will be made in the concerned group in the CBOA also. Please always be in touch in the group. So you download the circulars, go through the answers, and other type of questions that will be asked from the circular is also important. It is also one thing which is because as last minute rushing through the circular is very difficult. Now itself we can go through. Okay. Now. Now uh, we will. We are now uh, that is uh, now going to question number one twenty six. Test paper one. We are in test paper one. Now we are going to question number one twenty six. Question number one twenty five. We have finished. Question number one twenty six. We are taking up. Buy now and uh, and pay later. What type of card? It is a credit card. So question number one twenty six. It is a credit card. Okay. Question number one twenty seven. You read the question. All demand drafts below rupees twenty thousand necessarily to be issued, issued and cross, issued with the general crossing, issued with account payee crossing, customer's choice, bank's discretion. Friends, all DDs of 20,000 and above, all DDs of rupees 20,000 and above have to be issued with account payee crossing only. This is as for Banking Regulation Act. All DDs of 20,000 and above to be issued with account payee crossing only as per Banking Regulation Act Amendment. But the question is not that. The question is, all DDs below 20,000 to be necessarily issued, whether 20,000 and below to be issued with crossing, without crossing, etc. What is the correct answer for that? DDs of 20,000 and below, whether you can who cross or need not cross, that depends upon customer's choice. You do not have a choice over that. 20,000 and above, you have to necessarily put account pay crossing. Less than 20,000, don't put account pay crossing if the customer has not asked. Okay, it is customer's discretion. Customer may say, issue the DD to me without crossing. You have to issue the DD without crossing. Okay, now let's see the question. All DDs below 20,000 necessarily to be Issued and cross. No, not necessary. Issued with general crossing, not necessary. Issued with account pay crossing only, not necessary. Customer's choice. Question number 127, answer is D. 20, 000, below 20,000, it is a customer's choice. Question number 128. 
inchoket instrument what is an inchoket instrument inchoket as instrument is a instrument negotiable instrument in which a portion has not filled in by the holder or the drawer for example date column is left blank amount in word amount in figure is left in blank or that is the name of the payee is left any of the things is not filled in in the check or a negotiable instrument it is called an inchoket instrument inchoket instrument is defined in section 20 of the negotiable instrument act so question number 128 answer is section 20 of question so number 128 answer is section 1 uh, sorry section 20 of negotiable instrument act what crossing takes away the future the, takes away the future of assumption of defective free title available to the transferee it is answer is b not negotiable crossing this question they are frequently asking the not negotiable crossing takes away the de defective free title available to the transferee okay that is not negotiable crossing 129 answer is b <coughs> 130 the main difference between hypothecation and the pledge what is hypothecation hypothecation <coughs> Uh, what is hypothecation? Hypothecation is, for example, when you are giving a loan against book debts, when you are giving a sorry loan against stocks, when you are giving a loan against plant and machinery, when you are giving a loan against vehicle, you get a charge. The charge is called hypothecation. So in hypothecation, the possession and the ownership is with the borrower. You know, in the hypothecation, the possession and the ownership is with the borrower. Another type of uh, charge what you are having in the mobile asset pledge, for example, gold article. So he comes and gives a gold ornament to you. You give a loan to him. Here the possession is with you. The ownership is with the borrower. <coughs> in pledge, possession is with the creditor, and the ownership is with the debtor. So in the case of hypothecation, both possession and ownership is with the debtor. That is with the borrower. So the question is what? The main difference between hypothecation and pledge is in possession. So, for question number one one thirty, what is the difference between main difference in pledge and hypothecation? In pledge and hypothecation, the possession is the main difference. What are all the other differences between pledge and hypothecation? If they ask that question, you should not miss it. Okay. What is any other difference is there between pledge and hypothecation? Yes, there are two more differences of that. What are they? In the case of a hypothecation. If we want to go under Surface Act, so hypothecation sets a registration to be done. Again, I repeat, and hypothecation. If you go for Surface action, sets a registration should have been done. Whereas pledge for pledge, you cannot go under Surface action. Okay, so for Surface action, so sets a registration is must must for possession for hypothecation. Whereas for pledge, you cannot go under surface action, so no surface registration is required. For gold loans, you will not do surface registration. Whereas if you go give a loan against hypothecation, you are supposed to do surface registration. Then another difference is hypothecation is uh, is covered under law of limitation. That is, if you take a, if you are taking a pro note with our agreement within three years, you have to take an AOD if the loan is loan is not closed. In the case of a pledge, so pledge is not covered under law of limitation. Even after forty-eight months, even after thirty-six months, you can action a gold ornament in a public action. So by giving a notice to the borrower, for which there is no need for an AOD. If there is only a left-out deficient is there to file a suit for that, you require an AOD. But for pledge, it is not covered under law of limitation, whereas hypothecation is covered under the law of limitation. These are all the other two differences between pledge and hypothecation. If you ask that question, you should not miss it. That's why I am giving the difference. So the main difference between hypothecation and pledge is in possession. For question number thirty, the answer is B. Friends, we are not discussing only the particular question and answers. We are discussing the other related questions from these type of subjects also, which are being asked. One thirty one. Question number one thirty one. Guarantees and LCs, letters of credit issued by the bank. Are shown in the balance sheet as what? See what is the guarantee and the LC? They are called non-fund based limits. Guarantees, LCs, etc. They are called non-fund based limits. 
what is the fund based limit all your other advances advances which are appearing in the balance sheet are all fund based limit the non fund based limits are not shown as advances they are shown as a bought in the balance sheet they are shown in the balance sheet as contingent liabilities guarantees lcs issued by the bank are shown in the balance sheet in the footnote as contingent liabilities question number 131 answer is c question number 130 amount of term deposit that can be paid in cash less than 20000 including interest up to and inclusive of 20000 including interest less than 50000 including interest <laughs> including 50000 with interest last time people came and told me for one two two exam so exam was very easy but answers are that is confusing so you should know the correct answer so what is the amount of term deposit that can be paid in cash less than 20000 including interest so for question number 132 it is less than 20000 including interest if it is 20000 and above including interest it should not be paid in cash it should be printed only to the account or you have to issue account pay e draft or you can transfer the funds by means of nift or rtgs to some other bank okay so for question number 132 answer is ca question number 133 i told you deposits of 20000 and above with interest to be credited to the account only this is defined in which act they ask once they ask that section all of us know 20000 and above should be by dd only so this is told in which act which is section <coughs> this is told in section so note down the answer question number 133 the answer for the question is the above is defined in section 269 The above is defined in section 269T T for train. So the above is defined in section 269T of Income Tax Act. Deposits of 20,000 and above with interest to be paid should not be paid in cash. This is defined in section 269T of Income Tax Act 1961. Okay, you know what is the penalty if the deposit of 20,000 and above is paid in cash? The penalty is. <coughs> the amount he paid in cash you have to pay as a penalty to the income tax department by mistake if you have paid a deposit of rupees 20000 and above with the interest in cash then the penalty is that too much money you have to pay as a penalty to the income tax department see so if section 269t is not complied with you know 20000 and above in account pay dd only if 269t is not complied with penalty is the amount paid in cash all of us are aware but they asked the section this is defined in which section of the income tax act this is defined in section 271e e for elephant so this is defined in question number 134 the answer is this is defined in the penalty is defined in section 271 271 e of e for elephant e of income tax act 1961 This for the question number thirty three answer is two sixty nine T. Here the answer is two seventy one E of Income Tax Act nineteen sixty one. The last question of question paper one. The check is collected by a bank and credited to the account of the customer. The check is collected. You are collecting a check to the account holder and crediting to the customer. Later, it is found out that the check did not belong to the customer and the bank has collected the check negligently. Okay, you collected the check. And you credited to the customer account. Customer also withdrew the money. Subsequently, when it was found out that the customer has opened the account fictitiously, you are not complied with the KYC norms properly. Okay, so the bank has acted negligently in this case under Section 131 of Negotiable Instrument Act. The banker is liable for. What for the banker is liable to the true owner of the check, say redemption, material alteration, subrogation, conversion. So the correct answer for question number one thirty five is D conversion. What is conversion? That is interfering. That is with the money of the true owner. The money belong. You have not collected the money check for the true owner of the check. You have acted negligently. Accordingly, a fictitious customer has opened an account, deposited a check, and collected and taken the money. So this is called the conversion. The banker will not get protection under Section One Thirty One if he has acted, collected a check negligently. This is called the conversion. So question paper number one. We have finished all the 135 questions. We have finished. Now we are going to question test paper number two. Question paper number two is also made available to you sometime back. 
Now I will put the question paper two now. Don't worry about this PowerPoint. Everything will be made available to you, friends. So don't worry. Now, so this is test paper two. Test paper two, number twenty twenty with answers. It contains about maybe another than two questions. So the idea is now it is around twelve o'clock. So we have to run about till one thirty. Then tomorrow also we have a session night eight p.m. to nine p.m. So between between eight p.m. to nine p.m. tomorrow night we have a class. So we will be covering this one or two questions in two days, as well as followed by tomorrow's class. Okay, already it was made available to you. The link will be given to the organizers shortly. Okay. So sir, now uh, the sir, question. Sir, huh? sir, one second, sir. This second PowerPoint I don't have, sir. Can you share it in WhatsApp? I will share uh, power, in. The... No PowerPoint. PowerPoint. I will make available after the class. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, any of us let them see. I will make a question paper you already made available. The PowerPoint, yes, uh, I will make it available to you shortly. Maybe after the class, I will make available. You can make available to all. Sure, Don't sure, worry, sure. the PowerPoint you can use. It is for only reading purpose. I am not going to take anything by keeping the PowerPoint with me. Okay, sir. Now, types of charge. Now, uh, so from this slide, at least one or two questions will be there. See, for example, I, how the IBBS select the question paper? Because on 13th afternoon, all of you are going to have the exam, isn't it? So suppose if the IBBS selects a question from the types of chart, the same question will be there for 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4 also. The idea is the nature of question only will be different and the nature of question will be a little tough. That means, so you have to know all the level should know certain things based on the papers which we are discussing now. And most of the papers, most of the questions are selected by undergoing, keeping a lot of mind over that, preparing the PowerPoint and also seeing the previous year's question papers and various manuals or IBBS sites or RBA sites, etc. etc. Okay, friends, let us see. So you know uh, that is what is mortgage. Whenever a customer is giving an immovable property like land and building and against which you are creating a charge and you are giving a loan, the charge is called the mortgage. So immovable property, land and B. L and B is called the land and building. The charge the bank is getting against the immovable property is called the mortgage. Where mortgage is defined, maybe they ask for three to four. Under which section of which act mortgage is defined? So maybe for scale one, they will ask, when the immovable property is given, what is the charge the bank is getting? You will write mortgage. For scale to three to four, they will ask because you will not daily working, you will not come to, you will not remember the section. So now at least for the examination sake, you have to remember the section. So the mortgage is defined under section 58 of Transfer of Property Act. Mortgage is defined under section 58 of Transfer of Property Act. So please note it down. Then, so land and building, the charge bank is getting called mortgage. Mortgage defined under section 58 of the Transfer of Property Act. Then there is a thing called, so immovable property is land and building. Then there are other securities. These securities are called actionable claims. What are they? Actionable claims are known as, for example, book debts. You are giving a loan against a book debt. Okay, you will be having the book debts concept. Various authorities are having power. How much limit you can give and against the book debts? The loan given against book debts. The loan given against fixed deposit. You give a VSL against a fixed deposit. Or you take a fixed deposit as a collateral and you give you a loan. The loan given against a fixed deposit. And the loan given against a LIC policy. You know, again, LIC policy, you get the surrender value. Based on the surrender value, you fix margin of 25% or something like that, you give you a loan. NSC, National Savings Certificate. Against the NSC, you give based on the face value. Okay, whatever the value, not excluding the accumulated interest, you give loan against the NSC, against the face value. So, the book debts, fixed deposit, LIC, NSC. These things are called actionable claims. When loans are given against these securities, the charge the bank is getting is called assignment. So they ask the question, what is the charge the bank is getting when they give loan against fixed deposit? Generally, what we will write? Lien. 
no friends lien is only marking in the system the charge bank is getting when they give you a loan against fixed deposit the charge is called the assignment you have to pick the correct answer assignment where assignment is defined assignment is defined under section 130 of the transfer of property act uh, section is 130 of the transfer of property act then movable assets i know i told you in the before commencing the class loans against stocks vehicles plant and machinery they are all called movable assets when loans are giving against these securities bank is getting a charge called hypothecation okay where hypothecation is defined hypothecation is defined under surface act hypothecation is defined under surface act then bank also gives you know, gold ornament it is a movable item when loans are given against mobile item, the charge bank is getting is called a pledge. So, hypothecation is also a mobile item. Pledge is also a mobile item. What is the difference between the two? In hypothecation, possession and ownership is with the borrower. In pledge, ownership is with the borrower. Possession is with the bank. And another difference is hypothecation, such soil registration is a must. Pledge, it is not required. Hypothecation is covered under law of limitation. Pledge is not covered under law of limitation. Okay, where pledge is defined? Pledge is defined under section 172 of Indian Contract Act. Pledge is defined under section 172 of Indian Contract Act. Okay, paper securities. So, you know, fixed deposit is also a paper security. But if fixed deposit, the charge is bank is getting assignment coming to paper securities like shares debentures, units of mutual fund. So against these also, banks give you a loan. So that's the charge. <coughs> the charge bank is getting, when they give you a loan against these paper securities, the charge bank is getting is called the lien. Where lien is defined? Lien is defined in section 170 and 171 of Indian Contract Act. 170 talks about particular lien. So 171 talks about general lien. Bankers, general lien is available. When we discuss the legal paper, test paper 3, we will discuss in all those things. So section 170 and 171 discuss about the Indian contract that talks about the lien. What the paper security shares, differences and units of mutual fund, the charge bank is getting is called a lien. Friends, from this slide, one question will definitely come. You should be thorough. Then this slide, the, uh, compared to first slide continuation of that, this slide is also very important. So you should know bailment. So bailment is defined in section 148 of Indian Contract Act. Previous slide I told you actionable claim. What are all the actionable claims? Book debts, fixed deposit, then LIC policy, NSC. The charge bank is getting against the actionable claim is called assignment. Where actionable claims are defined, they are called actionable claims as per section 3 of Transfer of Property Act. ICA stands for Indian Contract Act. TPA stands for Transfer of Property Act. So you should know, suppose if they ask, fixed deposit, etc. are defined as trans uh, actionable claim. Actionable claim is defined by section 3 of Transfer of Property Act. Then, yeah, mortgage, you know, there are various types of mortgage, equitable mortgage, Simple mortgage, registered mortgage, like that, like that, many six, six, seven, eight mortgages are there. Generally, in banks, we go for equitable mortgage only. We don't go for other types of mortgage because if you go for other types of mortgage, the stamp duty will be very heavy. So we go for equitable mortgage. What is equitable mortgage? He comes and deposits the title deeds with you. So only the MODDT, only you are registering with the sub register office, wherever it is prevalent. You will not register the mortgage there. Okay. So uh, the mortgage other than equitable. So if it is an equitable mortgage, it need not be registered with the sub register, register of assurances. Other than equitable mortgage, all mortgages to be registered with the register of assurances where it is defined, it is defined in section 59 of the Transfer of Property Act. When we see the questions, we will understand. Again, my friends, I will tell you, equitable mortgage need not be registered with the sub register office. What you are registering in some states, you are registering only the MODDT. The rate of that is the stamp duty is very less for that. 
okay it is not registering the mortgage there is a lot of difference between registering the mortgage and registering the modrt modrt registration only takes place in some states it is not registering the mortgage all equitable mortgages need not be registered with the sub registrar so this is other than equitable mortgage all mortgages to be registered this is defined in section 59 of the transfer of property act then so so all mortgages other than equitable mortgage to be registered with the sub registrar within how many days you have to register it such a document to be presented within four four months from the date of execution for registration with the sub registrar of assurances so if you put through a registered mortgage today or if you put through a simple mortgage today we are putting through mostly only equitable mortgage in some exceptional cases only after getting permission from the competent authority you will put through simple mortgage okay and agriculture you may put through some simple mortgage so wherever you are putting through equitable mortgage uh, other than equitable mortgage that was to be registered with the sub registrar of assurances within four months from the date of execution the sub registrar will give another four months time registrar can increase it by another four months period that is maximum within eight months from the date of execution all mortgages other than equitable mortgage to be registered with the sub registrar of assurances this is defined by this is defined in section 23 of indian registration act 1908 friends these two slides questions will come let us go through the questions now the questions i'll make available to you Not there. Okay. Let me see the questions. Are there in front of you? A VSL is given. So question number one. A VSL is given against a fixed deposit of the bank. The charge bank gets is lien, hypothecation, assignment, none of these. The correct answer for the question is not lien. The correct answer is assignment. Generally, we go by lien. No friend. For this question, correct answer is answer is assignment. Answer is C. Question number two. <laughs> NSCs are assigned to the bank, so NSC is an actionable claim. NSCs are assigned to the bank, and loan is obtained by the customer. Bank give loans against NSCs on which value? Book value, accumulated value with the interest. None of these. So, so answer for this question is none of these. Bank gives loan against NSCs on its face value. Okay, the correct answer is face value. See, in Canada Bank, you give VSL against fixed deposit on its face value. You give loan against KDR on along with the accumulated interest, isn't it? Fixed deposit because interest is already going to the party SBI account. So you give a loan against fixed deposit on the face value. On the other hand, you give a loan against the KDR <coughs> along with the accumulated interest, ninety percent or eighty five percent, depending upon the margin requirement. In the case of an NSC. Loan is given against the face value, like your fixed deposit. So, answer for question number two is none of these. The correct answer is face value. Question number three: Charge created. You read the question. You have to read the question. Just for one minute, one second. You have to read the question in depth. Charge created by a borrower in favor of a secured creditor on movable assets without possession is known as Dash as per provisions of Dash Act. See of the question. Charge created by a borrower in favor of a secured creditor on movable assets without possession. That is, possession is with the borrower. Ownership is also with the borrower. What it is called? It is called hypothecation. Where hypothecation is defined, surface act. Isn't it? So you should be thorough like this. They will not simply ask for one to two. They will ask where hypothecation is defined. They will write surface act. Maybe for two to three, three to four. This question may come. Charge created by a borrower in favor of a secured creditor on movable assets without possession. With the possession for in the in favor of the secured creditor, it is pledge. This is without pledge is defined under Section One Seventy Two of the Indian Contract Act. This is without pledge. Okay, <laughs> when charge is done without possession, this is defined under the provisions of Act. So here the answer is uh, that is hypothecation, and the Act is surface Act. Suppose if they put a question with to possession, with to possession, you have to write pledge Indian Contract Act. Friends, any question will be asked. You should be thorough with the subject. Here, the correct answer is hypothecation provisions of the Surface Act. Okay, question number four. In which of the following cases bank has <coughs> floating charge? 
this was in the ask for three to four some time back to be in our bank other bank i do not know in which, in which of the following case bank has floating charge pledge hypothecation of machinery hypothecation of sorry i have hypo pledge hypothecation of machinery mortgage hypothecation of vehicle none of these in which of the following case bank has floating charge friends pledge whether bank has a floating charge no he comes and gives the gold ornaments you keep it with you when he release when he pays the money you release us the gold ornament over in the case of hypothecation of machinery no you you give a loan for machinery the machinery is that isn't it so you hypothecate the machinery to you okay the same machinery will be that mortgage no he gives a land and building till the loan is cleared the mortgage is will with you hypothecation of vehicle when vehicle is given loan is given but where that is a floating charge so in which of the following case bank has a floating charge the correct answer for the question is none of these but where where bank will have a floating charge bank will have a floating charge in the case of hypothecation of stock see stock is having you give you a loan that stock he makes as a finished goods fresh stock fresh stock enters into the go down okay on that new stock you will have a charge hypothecation so the question for uh, that is question number 4 is in which of the following case bank has a floating charge none of these the correct answer for the question is hypothecation of stock bank has a floating charge okay question number 5 <coughs> the charge bank gets in lorry receipt and railway receipt okay so what is the lorry receipt and railway receipt i just to brief it you will get an idea because many youngsters are that see for example i want to buy i am your customer i want to buy some goods from one of my that is a manufacturer in delhi let us assume he is going to send it through lorry he is going to send it through lorry he will book it in the lorry office and the lorry office will give you a receipt to him but i will not give the payment to him till the goods received by me okay but he he does not believe me so if the goods received by me if i show the lorry receipt and take the goods if i don't make the payment he will not get the payment no so what he will do he will draw a lorry receipt in favor of the bank in which i am having the account so for example i am having the account with you i am purchasing goods from delhi so that fellow will dispatch it from lorry so i have not yet paid the money he will draw the lorry receipt in favor of canara bank so i will come and ask canara bank whether lorry receipt has come sir yes lorry receipt has come uh, so then give the lorry receipt i will go and take delivery of the goods you will tell you make the payment i will have to send the payment to your your fellow in delhi then only i will release a lorry receipt to you so you will make the payment then bank will endorse the lorry receipt in favor of you you take the lorry receipt to the lorry office give and take the goods so till the lorry receipt is handed over to you till you make the payment bank has the possession on that lorry receipt on the goods indirectly bank is having the possession on the charge on the goods kept in the go down of the lorry office what it is called it is called constructive possession the charge bank gets in lorry receipt and railway receipt is called constructive possession question number 5 answer is constructive possession question number 6 lorry receipt and rr lr is lorry receipt rr for railway receipt lr and rr are called documents to title of goods as per section 2 of sale of goods act because these three questions they are frequently asked lr and rr lorry receipt and railway receipts are called documents to title to goods as per section 2 of sale of goods act these things you have to buy card no other option for you as per section 2 of sale of goods act okay lorry receipts and the uh, railway receipts are also called negotiable instruments act as per which act they are called negotiable instruments as per transfer of property act they are called a negotiable instrument not as per negotiable instrument act lorry receipts and railway receipts are called a negotiable instruments as per transfer of property act so okay these things you should know so floating charge it is for question number 4 floating charge that is hypothecation of stock charge the bank gets a lorry receipt is constructive possession lr and lr call title as sale of goods act <laughs> lr and rr are negotiable instrument as per transfer of property act 4 5 6 7 questions will come so you got to be thorough then question number 8 payment of goods 
for getting a loan is called a pledge. Bailment of uh, bailment of goods for getting a loan is called a pledge. Okay, this common sentence you should understand. Then, in, uh, this is very important. You have to apply your knowledge, matching knowledge, and you have to answer the question. What is bailment of goods to get a loan is called a pledge. What happened? He comes and gives the gold ornament to you. Possession is with you. Ownership is with him. So in bailment of goods to get a loan, in pledge, what happens? He comes and gives a gold ornament to you. Possession is with you. You give the loan to him. Ownership is with him. He comes and gives back the money. He takes possession back with him. Okay. Now, based on that, you answer the question. Question number nine. In a contract of bailment of goods, what is a contract of bailment? Pledge. In a contract of bailment of goods is nothing but pledge. In pledge, ownership of goods and possession pass around to the bailer. So in pledge, whether ownership of goods and possession pass around to the bailer, who is a bailer? Bailer is a person who wants a loan. Whether ownership and possession pass around to the person? No, already it is with him. Ownership is with him in bailment. Ownership is with him. And possession is also with him. He hands over the possession to the creditor. Okay. So answer A is not correct. Answer B. Ownership and possession of goods passes on to the bailey. Who is the bailey? Bank is the bailey. Whether ownership passes on a bailey under pledge? No. Only possession passes on to the bailey. So answer B is also not correct. Answer C. Ownership and possession remains with the bailey. How ownership and possession remains with the bailey? Possession only is with the bailey. Ownership remains with the bailey only. Bailar is nothing but your borrower. Yeah. So point number C is also not correct. Ownership of goods remains with the bailer. See point number D, you see. Ownership in, in what is bailment? Bailment is, that is, bailment of goods to get a loan is called a pledge. In pledge, ownership is remains with him. The ownership remains with the bailer. So for question number nine, the correct answer is D. So little mind you have to apply in the question, you have to answer. These type of questions will be asked for the higher levels. So in the case of a pledge, in the contract of bailment of goods, first A, B, C, 3 are wrong. D is the correct answer. Ownership of goods remains with the bailer. That is the appropriate answer after the options given. Out of the options given, appropriate answer you have to think. Answer is D. So for question number nine, answer is D. Question number 10. What is the meaning of pari pasu charge? So you would have heard of the concept of pari pasu charge. You would have heard about the concept of first charge, second charge, etc. What is a pari pasu charge? A charge created by banks on immovable and movable properties. When charge is shared by the banks are first charge, second charge, etc. When charge is shared by the banks in the ratio of their loans, charges which do not require registration with the sub register. So pari pasu charge means that is, one immovable property will be there. Based on that, loans will be given by two, three banks. So, uh, when the loan becomes bad, you will dispose the property and adjust the proceeds to the loan accounts. How much you will give to each bank, that depends upon the loan quantum of each bank. That is called the pari pasu charge. So, what is the correct answer? When charge is shared by the banks, in the ratio of that loans is called the pari pasu charge. Answer is C. Question number 10, answer is C. Now, what is the first charge, second charge? That also you should know. So first charge is, suppose if the loan is given, on the same property, another loan is given by another bank. So here, the understanding between the banks is, first if the loan becomes bad, the property will be disposed. Whomsoever is having the first charge, the entire proceeds will, will come to the first charge bank. After adjusting the liability, if any balance is there, that will be given to the other bank. That is the second charge bank. That is called the first charge, second charge. In pari pasu charge, whatever the ratio of the liability or the loan amount you are given, based on that, the property sale proceeds will be divided among the bank. This is called the pari pasu charge. For question number 10, answer is C. Okay? Question number 11. Where the principal money is secured is rupees 100 or more, a mortgage other than equitable mortgage has to be registered as per section dash of dash act. I told you, other than equitable mortgage, mortgages have to be registered with the sub register of assurances. As per which act, the mortgage other than equitable mortgage to be registered one as per section 59 of the transfer of property act. 
So answer for this question is where where the principal money secured is hundred rupees or more, a mortgage other than equitable mortgage has to be registered as per section fifty nine of Transfer of Property Act. As per section fifty nine section of Transfer of Property Act. Question number eleven. Question number twelve. <coughs> An equitable mortgage has been created. So this is the question. A little complicated question, but all of you know the answer. An equitable mortgage has been created to secure a housing loan given to Mr. Y. So whenever housing loan is given, we'll put an equitable mortgage. This mortgage reg registration, this mortgage reg requires registration dash within so many days. It, it, it requires registration with whom? With whom? Within how many days? Sub, sub registrar of assurances within four months. You know, equitable mortgage need not be registered with the sub registrar of assurances. Other than equitable mortgage only to be registered with the sub registrar of assurances within four months, registrar can give an another four months. This is defined in Indian Registration Act. We saw the slide. So answer A is not correct. It was registered immediately with the sir. So an housing loan has given to Mr. A. This mortgage requires registration with the dash within dash. So first answer is not correct. So second answer immediately with the sir. So then with the ROC within 30 days. ROC means register of companies within 30 days. A and B. Option B is A and B. Option E is A, B, C, all. So what that is the correct answer? So whenever you give a loan by putting the equitable mortgage, it need not be registered with the sub-registrar of assurances. Similarly, when you give a loan against a company property, then only it has to be registered with the ROC. Okay, but when you give an equitable mortgage loan, the mortgage has to be registered with the SERSOI within how many days, friends? Till last year, when you go for the exam, SERSOI registration to be done within 30 days of putting through the documentation or opening the loan account. The SERSOI Act is amended in January 2020. So the SERSOI registration to be done immediately on the date of opening the loan. The concept of 30 days, beyond 30 days, 60 days, paying fine and making it, everything is removed from the SERSOI Act now. So SERSOI registration to be done immediately on the date of opening the loan. The 30 days is removed now. So the answer is immediately with the SERSOI. An equitable mortgage has been secured. Sorry, an equitable mortgage has been created to secure the housing loan given to Mr. A. This mortgage requires registration immediately with the set soil. Immediately with the set soil, the registration requires. Question number 12, answer is B. Question number 13, debiting interest to loan accounts are to be rounded off to nearest. 5 paise, 10 paise, 25 paise, 50 paise, none of these. Friends, you know, other than agricultural loans, every month interest on the last day of the month, interest is debited to the loan account. So when the interest is debited, it is rounded by system rounds it up to what? It is rounded up to nearest to one rupee. So answer for question number 13 is none of this. The correct answer is rounded off to nearest to rupees one. Similarly, for deposit accounts also, interest is rounded off to nearest to one rupee. If it is 50 paise and above, it will be rounded off to one rupee. If it is less than 50 paise, it will be rounded off to the lawyer one rupee. Okay, both for deposits and advances, is rounded off to the one rupee. So here one rupee is not there. For question number 13, answer is none of these. Question number 14. RBI gives instruction to banks on interest rates on loans and advances as per section dash of dash act and it cannot be questioned in a court of law as per section dash of dash act. You know, from 1-10-2019, interest on housing loans, MSC loans are linked to RLLR. So far, you are linking it to MCLR. Now, link loans on agricultural advances is linked to MCLR. This is how you are doing because RBA has given you an instruction. Okay, so the question is, RBA gives instruction to banks on interest rates on loans and advances as per section 21 of BR Act. So you have to write section 21 of BR Act. And it cannot be questioned in a court of law. And it cannot be questioned in the court of law as per which section, as per section 21A of BR Act. Again, I repeat, 
RBA gives instruction to banks on interest rates on loans and advances as per section 21 of the Act, and it cannot be questioned in a court of law as per section 21A of the Act. All these things are available in your credit policy. Okay, this is available in the RBA website. It is credit available in the credit policy also. If you have correct the recent circular on credit policy, Canada Bank is 850 for 2020. Okay, question number 15. <laughs> Cost relating to registration charges, stamp duty payment, etc., can be included in cost when cost of house is up to rupees 10 lakhs. Up to rupees 10 lakhs for loan to value calculation purpose. So, this is very important. We can include the registration charges, stamp duty, etc., to work out the margin, etc., if the cost of the house is up to rupees 10 lakhs. Question number 15, answer is 10 lakhs. Question number 16. At the time of sanctioning loans, banks need to obtain these are all the credit policy are the people will tell so questions are asked in credit policies are they will come and tell when you come and tell after the exam questions are asked only in circular sir questions are asked only in uh, that is uh, what is a general banking sir that means we have not read that portion that is idea okay if you do if you are it, you will recollect the questions otherwise you will come and tell sir a lot of questions are asked in technology only sir that means i have not read the technology that is a logic okay so so this is also the credit policy at the time of sanctioning loans Banks need to obtain valuation reports from two independent valuers. When the value of immobile property is rupees 10 crores and above, value of loans is rupees 10 crores and above, value of property is 5 crores and above, loan amount is 5 crores. It's a confusing sir, answer. Okay, the correct answer is you have to take two valuation from two independent valuers when the value of the immobile property is rupees 10 crores and above, not the loan amount. When the value of the property is 10 crores and above, you have to take independent valuation from two independent valuers. So, question number 16, answer is A. Question number 17. Post disbursement of legal do audit documents is required when an exposure to a borrower is rupees dash crores and above, and it has to be conducted once in dash years to coincide with. So, if the exposure to a borrower is rupees 5 crores and above, if an exposure, exposure means all the loans put together. When the exposure to a borrower will be 5 crores and above, a legal audit has to be conducted once in three years. Once in three years to coincide with what? To coincide with your regular inspection, RBIA, risk-based internal audit. This is a credit policy. This is also available in your credit monitoring circular, HO circular 139 bar 2020. Okay, post disbursement legal audit of documents is required when the exposure to a borrower is rupees 5 crores or above and it has to be conducted once in three years to coincide with RBIA, regular, uh, sorry, uh, risk based internal audit. Okay, anything they will ask. Okay, you should be able to answer. Sometimes two fill up the blank, they will give half of marks for each fill up the blanks. Okay, sir. Question number 18 lending target. For weaker section advances, uh, so I think last class itself, the other faculty has covered priority sector to you. So in the PowerPoint presentation for, for test number two, few questions I have taken from the, that is from the priorities because from 4th September 2020, the priority sector definitions have undergone a lot of changes. RBA circular is there. Our HO circular is also there. In depth, Mr. Ravi Kumar has covered the priority sector. So you go through the slide, go through the questions given by him. I have also covered in my slide for test number two, PowerPoint presentation, I have covered the priority sector changes. The changes I have given in a different color. I will show it to you quickly. So before that, these questions are so some select questions I have taken. You already read it there. We will go quickly go through the answers. Then we'll go to the other questions. Lending target for weaker section uh, advances within the priority sector for domestic commercial banks is dash or priority sector as a 31st March 2024. 10%, 12%, 30%, none of these. We'll just see the slide and we'll go through the answer. Okay. See, one minute only I'll go because he has already covered. I don't want to spend much time. So, priority sector classification underwent a lot of changes from 4 9 2020. 
these are all the priority sector agriculture msme export credit education housing social infrastructure renewable energy others okay eight categories are there in the priority sector let us not go in depth to it so here you see loans the question is with regard so here whatever i have put in the pink color is the change whatever i have put in the within brackets blue color is the existing okay so total priority sector so this is the target for years given two three slides target for domestic commercial banks including foreign banks with the 20 branches and above but excluding rrbs small finance banks and urban cooperative bank the target which we are seeing in the slide is applicable for canara bank or domestic commercial bank including foreign banks with the 20 branches and above foreign banks with less than 20 branches rrbs small small finance banks and ucbs targets are different that is shown in the different slide he has also showed to you no issue now the question is total priority sector target should be 40 percent of the adjusted net bank credit or credit equivalent of the off balance sheet exposure whichever is higher similarly agriculture target is 18 percent of the adjusted net bank credit or credit equivalent of the off balance sheet exposure whichever is higher out of the 18 percent target 10 percent presently 8 percent should go for small and marginal farmers Similarly, weaker section advances should be 12% of the adjusted net bank credit by 2024 or 10% as on date. Okay, this 10% and 12% when they have to go already, you would have told you. So by 2021, in the super micro, it is 7.5. Revised target for small and marginal farmer and weaker section will be implemented as on that. 2021, 8%, 21-22, 9%, 23-9.5 by 20. 24 small and marginal farmer should be 10 percent of adjusted net bank credit or credit equivalent of the off balance sheet exposure whichever is more for weaker section it is 10 percent 11 percent 11.5 12 percent of what of what adjusted net bank credit or credit equivalent of the off balance sheet exposure whichever is more okay keep that in mind but now you see the question sir now you see the question you will get an idea what i put in the question Question number 18, we are discussing. A little confusing, but questions are there. They are asking in the exam. Lending target for weaker section of advances within the priority sector for domestic commercial bank is dash percent of priority sector as at March 21st, 31st, 24th. See, you know. Today, the weaker section target is 8% of what? 8% of adjusted net bank credit or credit equivalent of off balance sheet exposure, whichever is more. By 31st March, how much it has to reach? 12% of adjusted net bank credit or credit equivalent of the off balance sheet exposure, 12% of what? Credit equivalent or adjusted net bank credit, whichever is more. But whether I ask the question percentage of credit equivalent of off balance sheet exposure or adjusted net bank credit, no. The question is <coughs> lending target for weaker section within the priority sector should be dash percentage of priority sector dash percentage of priority sector, not dash percentage of ANBC, dash percentage of priority sector as of 31st March 2024. If it is dash percentage of adjusted net bank credit, you will give the answer 12%. But here the question is dash percentage of priority sector. So what is the total percentage of priority sector? We have to reach 40%, isn't it? So. So, you know, weaker section should reach 12%. In priority sector, how much should be the weaker section? That is the question. The weaker section, how much should be the weaker section in A and B, C is not the question. The question is, by 2024, in priority sector, how much should be the weaker section? You know, in 2024, the weaker section should reach 12%. In, in priority, what is the priority sector percentage? 40%. So, how you have to calculate? 12 divided by 40 into 100. 12 divided by 40 into 100 is equal to 30%. So the answer for the question number 18 is 30%.
So it is not 12 percent, friends. You can write 12 percent if they put the word lending to target for weaker section advances within the priority sector of commercial commercial bank is dash percent of adjusted net bank credit or credit equivalent of the off balance sheet exposure, whichever is high as on 31st March. If they put the correct answer is 12 percent. But since they have put dash percentage of priority sector, you have to calculate the 12 percent is on 40 percent. 12 divided by 40 into 100, it comes to 30 percent. So very be careful whether they ask on priority sector or on adjusted net bank rate. Question number 18, answer is 30, not 12. Okay, good. Then question number 19, loans up to dash to individuals whose annual household income does not exceed rupees 1.60 lakhs in non-rural area and rupees 1 lakh in rural area has to be classified as priority sector others up to 1 lakh. So for question number 19, answer is up to rupees 1 lakh. Everything is in the PowerPoint. Mr. Ravi Kumar's PowerPoint also will be with you. Up to rupees 1 lakh. Okay. Loans up to dash crores to startups engaged in agriculture will be classified as Loans up to rupees 50 crores. So these are all the new changes which it has come in the priority sector classification. Loans up to rupees 50 crores to startups engaged in agriculture will be classified as agriculture ancillary. Friends, even for three to four, many questions will come to this time on priority sector classification and your GECL and the government guidelines or RBA guidelines on stressed assets. Okay, questions will come. Be thorough with that. Okay, 50 crores. Classified as priority agriculture ancillary. Agriculture ancillary. Question number 21. Loans up to 10 crores to borrowers for building health care facilities in tier 1 to tier 6 centers will be classified as social infrastructure. True or false? So it is true. Okay, true. Loans up to 10 crores to borrowers for building up health care facilities in tier 1 to tier 6 tensors will be classified as social infrastructure. True or false? True. Now you should know what is a tier 1 center, what is a tier 6 center. You know what is a metro, what is an urban, what is a semi-urban, what is a rural. It is based on the population classification. Similarly, tier 1, tier 2, tier 3, tier 4, tier 5, tier 6 centers is classified based on the population classification. I will show the link to you. Uh, see, so a yeah, center is called tier 1 center. If the population in this uh, in the center is, sorry, that is, uh, yes, a tier is called a tier 1 center. If the population is 1 lakh and above, if they ask the question, you should not miss it. PowerPoint, I will make it available to you. Don't worry. If the center is called tier 1 center, if the population is 1 lakh and above, tier 2 center, if it is 50,000 to 99,999, like that it goes. Tier 6 center is a center where population is less than 5,000. So, which are all that they may ask? That is, they may ask the question, which one of the following is not correctly given? They give for one tire, they give a wrong population, they will ask you to pick it. So you should know the, all the six tires and what is the population category. Okay, sir? Okay. Now, <clears throat> let us go to the question paper. Okay, sir. okay. So, <clears throat> so, so that is, the answer is correct. So loan up to 10 crores. For borrowers for building up health care for tier 1 to tier 6 centers will be classified as social infrastructure. Answer is true. Question number 22. Loans given by banks to NBFC. What is NBFC? Non-banking financial <laughs> companies. So loans given by banks to NBFCs for on lending, for term lending component under agriculture, up to rupees 10 lakhs per borrower will be classified as priority sector by the bank. Answer is 10 lakhs. Question number 22, answer is 10 lakhs. Everything is available in the PowerPoint. As per RBI guidelines, for agricultural loans, no collateral is required for loan amounts up to. So as per RBI guidelines, for agricultural loans, no collateral is required for loan amount up to rupees 2 lakhs. Up to rupees 5 lakhs, up to rupees 10 lakhs, none of this. Friends, maybe last two days, two weeks back, or in a show circle has come, giving a revised classification on the collateral security that is required for agricultural loans in Canara Bank. Till that circular has come, collateral, as per your show circle, if I am correct, 270 per 2020, where the various collateral securities are given for agricultural loans. 
there it is told for agricultural loans up to two lakhs, no collateral security is required. But subsequent, which was HOS of Tamil has come, maybe is eight hundred plus or seven hundred plus, maybe two weeks back, they told for agricultural loans up to one point six zero lakhs, no collateral security is required. If it is above one point six zero lakhs, collateral security is required because the Central Bank of India has told for agricultural loans. Up to 1.60 lakhs, there is no need for collateral security. Above 1.60 lakhs, collateral security is required. In Canara Bank also, recently the circular is modified. In Canara Bank also, for agriculture loan, collateral security is required. Above 1.60 lakhs. So the answer for the question is none of these. The correct answer is 1.60 lakhs. Question number 24. What is the interest rate to be charged? For the educational loan at DI scheme, what is DI scheme? Differential rate of interest scheme. Okay, so the, <coughs> that quickly you will go through. So because though a very PowerPoint presentation there with regard to periodic rate, you can go through Mr. Ravi Kumar's. You can also go through this. Okay, MSME. All the classifications are there. Questions are sure. Many questions will come. Okay, don't miss it. So bigger sections, definitions, everything is there. <coughs> Uh, DRI. See, to be eligible to get a DRI loan, the annual family income does not exceed 18,000 rural area and 24,000 in semi-urban and urban areas. To get an, a loan, sorry, uh, to get a loan under DRI scheme, annual family income should not exceed this 18,000 rural area and 24,000 semi-urban and urban areas. The rate of interest is 4% simple per annum, no subsidy and no margin for DRI loans. Interest rate is very simple, 4%. These numbers you should know. Two third of DRI advances should be should be sent through, should be dispersed through rural and semi-urban branches. Two third of the DRI advances to be dispersed through rural and semi-urban branches. And another condition is 40% of the DRI advances to be given to SEST beneficiaries. This question they may ask for one to two. So how much percentage of advances should be rooted to DRI, the rural semi-urban branches, two-third of the rural advances? Then how much advances should go to SEST beneficiaries? 40% of the DRI advances should go to SEST beneficiaries. What is the maximum quantum you can give under its DRI loans? The maximum quantum you can give under DRI loans is 15,000. However, you can give up to 20,000 if you are giving an housing loan for SCST borrowers under Indira Avas Yojana, under DRA scheme, you can give up to 20,000. In the case of a physically challenged person under DRA scheme, we can give 15,000 for any productive activity plus 5,000 rupees additional for artificial limb, braille typewriter, etc. With regard to educational loan, what is the maximum loan you can give under DRA scheme? The maximum loan under, you can give under DRA scheme for educational loan as applicable to the educational scheme guidelines. Here, this 15,000 is 20,000 is only for these schemes, any productive purpose scheme. But if you, you can give educational loan at the rate of 4% simple interest, both for management quota as well as IBS model educational scheme. So up to, suppose if the borrower is if the borrower got an admission in a college where the fee structure is 4 lakhs, and if your scheme permits to give you 4 lakhs, you can give. What is the maximum rate of interest you will charge? You will charge only 4% simple rate of interest. Okay. <laughs> One minute. Eh? We'll go to the question. Okay. So the question is, uh, uh, that is, we are seeing the question. Uh, okay. Well, well, question number 24. What is the interest rate to be charged for the education loan under DRA scheme? No loan can be given under DRA. 4% simple, normal interest rate, and of this. The rate of interest will be 4% simple interest you give. What is the amount you will give? As applicable to the borrower under educational loan scheme. Okay, not 15,000. Then, question number 25, you read very clearly. This question was asked recently in some other bank. All new floating rate loans to medium enterprises extended by banks from October 2019 shall be linked to the external benchmark that is RLLR in our bank and not with MCLR as per RBA guidelines. So what I told you, RBA guidelines. 
So all new floating rate loans to medium enterprises extended by banks from October 19 should be linked to the external benchmark rate. In our bank, we have taken the external benchmark as RLLR and not MCLR as per RBI guidelines, true or false. Most of us will write true for the question. See friends, here I want to tell you, Reserve Bank of India has come out with a guideline in the month of August 2019 stating that all loans to MSC, micro and small, all loans given to micro and small and also retail loans should be linked to RLLR or external benchmark rate with effect from October 1st, 2019. They have not told medium sector loans to be covered under RLLR. So medium sector loans to be covered under RLLR as per RBI guidelines from 142020 only. In Canada Bank, for entire MSME, micro, small, medium, we are covering the rates as per RLLR, even with effect from 1st October 2019. If you see the circular issued by HO, they are given in the first paragraph, as per RBI guidelines, it has to be covered only for MSE, but we are covering for MSME also. So what is the question? All new floating rate loans to medium enterprises extended by banks from October 2019 shall be linked to the external benchmark and not MCLR as per RBI guidelines. The answer is false. Medium enterprises to be covered under RLLR only from 142020 from October 2019, which has to be covered, that is MSC, not MSME. That is a difference between MSC and MSME. Micro and small only to be covered and retail loans to be covered. So MSME to be covered from 142020 only. Answer is false as per RBA guidelines. Question number 25. Out of the following, staff loan, loans against deposits, funded interest term loan, working capital term loan, which one is not linked to RLLR? Staff loan is not linked to RLLR. Loan against deposit is not linked to RLLR. Funded interest term loan. What do you mean by funded interest term loan? A borrower is having a term loan. You are restructuring the term loan and giving a revised schedule of repayment. That is called the funded interest term loan. The interest rate you are fixing for interest funded interest term loan need not be linked to RLLR. Similarly, what do you mean by working capital term loan? A borrower is having a working capital OCC, that is, he is not able to repay. You are restructuring the working capital, and whatever balance on that day, you are keeping in a term loan. You are asking him to pay separately. That is called working capital term loan. So, interest for staff loan, loans against deposits, funded interest term loan, and working capital term loan, the interest rates are not linked to RLLR. Banks can fix their own rates. So, they are, so which one of these? One is A and B only. Two is A, B, C only. Three is A to D. Four, all are linked to RLLR. So, what is the question? Which one is not linked to RLLR? A is not linked, B is not linked, C is not linked, D is not linked. So, answer for the question is three. A to B, all, all the four are not linked to RLLR. So, the answer will become confusing. The question is not linked to RLLR. All the four, four is not linked to RLLR. Answer is three, A to D. Question number 27. What is the limitation? So, this slide we will see. Then with regard to the limitation period, you will get an idea. Questions will be asked over there. Any group? Ah, okay, sir. So let us see the limitation period. I already told you, friends, limitation is not applicable to pledge. Limitation is also not applicable to lien. What is lien? When banks, if there is giving a loan against shares, defensures, mutual fund schemes, etc., the charge bank is getting is called the lien. Where lien is defined, land is defined in section 170 and 171 of Indian Contract Act. What is pledge? Bainment of goods to get a loan is called the pledge, for example, gold loan. Where pledge is defined under section 172 of Indian Contract Act. Both pledge and lien are not covered under the law of limitation. All, <coughs> all other types of charges are covered under law of limitation.
testing. What is the limitation period with regard to what is the limitation period with regard to loan secured by mortgage? Loan secured by mortgage, the limitation period is 12 years from the date of installment, from 12 years from the due date of the installment for term loan, not 12 years from the loan paper. Only in the case of a DP and hypothecation, it is 12, uh, this is three, three years from the date of loan paper. With regard to a mortgage, when the AOD is due, 12, in the case of a term loan, which is given against a mortgage, 12 years from the date of that is due date of the installment. For example, when you are given a term, you are given a housing loan, first 12 months he has repaid, from 13th month he has not paid. So from 13th month onwards, within 12 years, you have to take an AOD or you have to file a mortgage. So, so in the case of a term loan, it is 12 years from the date of due date of the installment for the term loan, which he has not repaid. For running accounts like OCC, what is the limitation period for mortgage? 12 years from the date of document. In the case of a term loan, it is 12 years from the date of installment due. In the case of an OCC, mortgage limitation is 12 years from the date of documentation. Then, recovery of loss caused by fraud. For example, there is a fraud in an account. You have to file a suit, no? Within how many years you have to file a suit? This is three years from the date of deduction of fraud, not from the date of fraud. Generally, people write date of fraud. So today, the fraud has taken place two years back. Today, only the fraud is deducted. Then from today, within three years, either you have to get an AOD from the fraudster or you have to file a suit in the court of law. Recovery of loss caused by fraud is three years from the date of deduction of fraud. Then right of foreclosure. Now let's not discuss what is right of foreclosure. Let us keep in mind the law of limitation for right of foreclosure is, is available in the mortgage suit. Right of foreclosure is 30 years when the mortgage money becomes due. 30 years you keep in mind. Deposit account. Deposit accounts are also covered under the law of limitation. Don't be under the impression only loan accounts are not covered under are covered under law of limitation. Even deposit accounts are also covered under the law of limitation. How it is the customer is coming to you, is coming a deposit receipt to you. Let us assume this deposit was opened 25, 30 years back in your branch. By this time, where you have sent the deposit, you are supposed to send the deposit to Depositors Education Awareness Fund with the Reserve Bank of India. You are searching all the documents. Nothing is available to you with regard to the deposit. You are writing to HO. HO is also telling no such records from us. We have not sent, sent anything to DEAF like that. Then customer will ask, give me the money, give me the money. You are telling no such thing. Then he will ask you, give you, he will ask you, give you a letter. So he will give the letter stating that the money is not with you, with us. So, so in the case of a deposit account, the law, of, he has to go to court. No, he has to go to somebody. Sir, I have kept the money with the bank. Bank is telling they are not having the money. Then he has to go to the bank. So within how many years he has to approach the bank? Three years from the date of he demanding the money from you. Today I'm coming and demanding. You tell no, you give me a letter. So from today, within three years, I have to file a suit against the bank in the case of that in the case of a deposit from three years from the date of demand by the customer. Appeal to high court against a lower court. Within how many days you have to appeal? 90 days from the date of decree. Decree is issued by the lower court. Within 90 days, you have to file the suit in the higher court. Then execution of degree. So 12 years from the date of decree. Okay. Other things there is no issue. So um, we'll see it now. See. Uh, so what is the limitation period in respect of right of foreclosure? 30 years. What is the limitation period when government wants to take legal action? So government wants to take legal action. The limitation period is 30 years. Here also it is 30 years. 28, 27, 30 years. Okay. Now up to this, we have seen certain aspects with regard to your credit policy or general things with regard to loans and loans and advances period. And priority sector also we have seen. We also seen the different types of charges the bank is getting. The remaining few slides, maybe before calling it a day, the remaining few slides we are going to see the Partnership Companies Act and uh, the Partnership Act and certain related questions which are being asked there. PowerPoint is also there. Wherever it is required, we'll go through the PowerPoint. Otherwise, we'll skip it. It is made available to you. Okay, now let us see the question. <coughs> question number 29. Maximum number of partners is defined in which act? Partnership Act, Company Act, RBI Act, 
none of this friends the maximum number of partners is defined in that is companies act section 464 of the companies act defines the maximum number of partners as on today as per the companies act the maximum number of partners in a partnership firm as per section 464 of the companies act is 100 Okay, keep that in mind. So, where the maximum number of partners is defined, maximum number of partners is defined not in the Partnership Act, not in the RBI Act. It is defined in the Companies Act as per Section 464. Today, the maximum number of partners in a partnership firm as per Companies Act is 100. Next question: What is the maximum number of partners in a partnership firm as per Rule 10 of the Companies Rule 2014? Friends, so I told you. the maximum number of partners is defined in the company act that is a maximum okay today it is 100 then there is a concept called companies rule 2010 sorry companies rule number 10 of companies rule 2014 this rule will tell this rule will go through the part company act as per the company act the maximum number of partners today is 100 okay but you should also when whenever a partnership is coming for a loan you should see what is the maximum number of partners in the partnership firm as per the company act it is 100 but you should also see what is the maximum number of partners permitted as on date as per rule 10 of the company's rule 2014 the rule 10 of the company's rule 2014 is only based on that only the maximum number of partners can be in a partnership firm even though the company's act says 100 the company's rule rule number 10 will fix the maximum number of partners it cannot be more than what is fixed in the company act it cannot be more than 100 but it can be less than 100 as on today even though the companies act says maximum number of partners as per section 464 of the companies act is 100 the rule 10 of the companies act 2014 says the maximum number of partners is only 50 okay today if you want to give a loan to a partnership firm you have to see what is the maximum number of partners in the partnership firm as per rule 10 of the companies act today it is only 50 So even though the company act permits hundred, the rule restricts it to fifty. The rule can restrict it to less than, and um, that is what company act say. The rule cannot yet exceed what the company act say. Okay, today it is fifty. So that you should know. Everything is in the PowerPoint. Don't worry. Then question number thirty-one. This question they are asking frequently. A registered partnership firm can be sued by other, and it cannot sue others. it cannot be sued by others but it can sue others it cannot be sued by others and also it cannot sue others none of this so this question they are frequently asking there are two types of partnership form registered partnership form and unregistered partnership form with whom a partnership to be registered with registrar of firms okay a partnership firm has to be registered with the registrar of firms whether banks have to deal only with the registered partnership firms no banks can give loan even to a non registered partnership firm registration of the partnership firm is not mandatory but there are certain disadvantages if the partnership firm is not registered if a partnership firm is not registered what will happen suppose this an unregistered partnership firm cannot to sue others it cannot go to a court against somebody whereas an unregistered partnership firm can be sued by others anybody can file a suit against an unregistered partnership firm but an unregistered partnership firm cannot file a suit against others whereas a registered partnership firm anybody can file a suit against a registered partnership firm and the registered partnership firm can also file a suit against others okay keep that in mind so that is a disadvantage of unregistered partnership firm there is not compulsion for banks how to deal only with registered partnership firm now let us see the question a registered partnership firm can be sued by other and it cannot sue others wrong a registered partnership firm 
can be sued by others it can also sue others so point number a is not correct b it cannot be sued by others but it can sue others no registered partnership firm can be sued by others it can sue others also then registered partnership firm cannot be sued by others and also it cannot sue others no it can sue others it can be sued others also so answer for question number 31 is none of these so if you know the subject then you will be able to answer whatever the confusing answer is question number 32 you have a partnership account with three partners a b and c all the three partners gave authority to mrs a who is not a partner to operate the account so there are three partners a b c all the three partners joined together they gave the authority to operate the partnership account to one mrs a who is not at all a partner whether you have to accept it yes the part as per the partnership act any that is all the partners join together they can give the mandate to operate the account to any other partner or even to a third party okay so this is so that is you have partnership account all the three partners give that mrs c to operate the account will you accept it answer is can be accepted so question number c sorry no cannot be accepted can be accepted if it is registered can be accepted if it is attested by notary none of these so answer for the correct answer for the question is 32 the answer, correct answer is it can be accepted no need for any notary registration no need for any registration all the partners joined together can give you a simple letter to give you a third party to operate the account question number 32 answer is none of these okay question number 33 one of the partners who is not an authorized partner to operate the partnership account use stop payment instruction for a check issued by an authorized signatory of the firm let us assume there are three partners a b c so one of the authorized signatories issued a check the authorized signatory can be a partner the authorized signatory can need not be a partner but one if there is one partner who is not an authorized signatory for the partnership but he is a partner he gives a stop payment check issued by a person who is an authorized signatory will you accept it yes so cannot be accepted no if all partners sign the stop payment accept we can accept no only authorized signatory can use stop payment no none of this yes so the correct answer for the question is none of this the correct answer is any one partner can give stop payment instruction even though he is not an authorized partner. Will you accept it? Answer A is not correct. Answer B is not correct. Answer C is not correct. Answer D is the correct. So when there is an enough answer, the correct answer is yes. Any partner can give stop payment instruction. Okay, question number 33, answer is D. Question number 44. A minor was admitted to the benefits of the partnership firm for taking benefits of the partnership. On becoming major, within how much period he has to decide whether he wants to continue as a partner or not? The correct answer for the question is answer C. Within six months of he attaining majority or within six months of he knowing that he has been admitted to the benefits of the partnership, whichever is later, within this period, he has to inform the partnership whether he wants to continue or he wants to discontinue. Okay, so for question number 34, answer is C. You just note down, you read it, you'll get an idea. Then, this is question number 35, is very important. They are asking the question. So, question number 34 is also important. Question number 35 is also very important. This is question number 35 is called rule in the client on case. You would have read for JIB, CIB, etc. This is called rule in the client on case. You read the question. Is that a partner of XYZ partnership firm? expired on 1st January when the outstanding liability in the cash credit account with limit of 20 lakhs was 16.85 lakhs. What has happened? So one Mr. Z has died when the liability in the account is 16.85 lakhs. Subsequently, there was a, a sum of rupees 1.40 lakhs has been credited to the account and checks for 2.3.25 lakhs has been debited. <laughs> What is the liability of the estate, not he, of the estate, I state mean legal tax. What is the liability of the estate of the deceased partner for this loan account after, after the transactions if balance confirmation letter is not obtained? I will tell you. In the case of a liability account, 
running account of a partnership firm. This is applicable only to a running account like OD, OCC of a partnership account. This is not applicable to the term loan. What is that I will tell? Suppose the liability is 16.85 lakhs in this case. At that point of time, one of the partners have died. When one of the partners have died, so you have to freeze the account. You are supposed to get immediately what is known as balance confirmation letter. It is, it is nothing like you, it is like your AOD. You have to get a balance confirmation letter from the legal hats of the deceased partner. Suppose 16.85 lakhs, you should go and get a AOD from the legal hats of the deceased partner and the surviving partners also. So if you are not obtained that, that is balance confirmation letter from the legal hats of the deceased partner, the rule in the client on case will apply. What is the rule in the client on case? When X has died, the liability in the account was 16.85 lakhs. Subsequently, there was a credit of 12.10 lakhs. Say friends, as per the rule in the client on case, the legal hats of the deceased partner so he is not liable for the subsequent debits in the account. Again, I repeat, if you have not got the balance confirmation letter, the legal hats are not liable for the subsequent debit. On the other hand, they will get the benefit of subsequent credits in the account. So after the death of the one of the partner, you have to get the balance confirmation letter from the legal hats of the deceased partner. In this case, you have not obtained. What you did, 16.85 lakhs. So you cannot file suit against the legal hearts of the deceased partner for 16.85 lakhs. You cannot file suit against the legal hearts of the deceased partner for the 3.25 lakhs also. Then for what amount you can file suit against the legal hearts of the deceased partner? There was a credit of 12.10 lakhs. 16.85 minus 12.10. If you want to file a suit to the legal hearts of the deceased partner, you can file suit only for 4.75 lakhs. 16.85 minus 12.10, 4.75. On the other hand, surviving partner, you can file your suit because there is already credit has come. So 3.25 debit. Along with this debit, you can file a suit against the surviving partner. Against the deceased legal heart of the deceased partner, you can file your suit only to the extent of 4.75 lakhs because the subsequent credit in the account, the legal has or that is they'll be cleared of the liability. Whereas subsequent debits, they are not responsible. The answer for question number 35, answer is C. This is called rule in the client on case. So this question, by giving an example, they are asking. So go through it. Question number 36. Uh, which is the following group of person has be, can, can become partners in a partnership form? So I'll just show the slide to you. Then you will get an idea. I say, told you. Uh, so number of partners as per section 464 of the Companies Act makes it maximum 100. But the rules limit, but the rules limit can be prescribed, but it cannot exceed 100. As per rule 10 of the Companies Act, rule number 2015, today the maximum number of partners is only 50. Then who cannot be a partner in a partnership firm? A minor cannot be a partner in a partnership firm. An insolvent person cannot be a partner in a partnership firm. And an insane person cannot be a partner in a partnership firm. Then, as per Supreme Court judgment, HUF cannot be a partner. Because who, who told HUF should not be a partner in a partnership firm? As per Supreme Court verdict, HUF is not a legal entity. <laughs> then, NBFE cannot be a partner in a partnership firm. This is as per which act? This is as per RBA direction. So a minor cannot be a partner. An insolvent person cannot be a partner. An insane person cannot be a partner. This is as per law. Then HUF cannot be a partner as per, that is, uh, as per your Supreme Court judgment. Then NBFC cannot be a partner as per RBA instruction. Okay, now let us see here. Question, this question. Which of the following group of persons can become partners in a partnership firm? A public company, a HUF, a private company, and a NBFC. No, because HUF cannot be a partner, NBFC cannot be a partner. A is not the correct answer. A public company, a private company, and another partnership firm. Yes, they can become partner in a partnership firm. 
in a part don't be under the impression a partnership firm means it is only by individuals a public company can be a partner in a partnership firm the private company can be a partner in a partnership firm another partnership firm also can be a partner in the partnership firm a minor a private company and a public company cannot be because a minor cannot be a partner then none of these the answer for question number 38 the correct answer is answer is b then question number 37 certificate of incorporation used to be obtained for which types of companies friends there are two types of now we have seen partnership now we are going to the company side there are two types of companies you know uh, that is public limited company private limited company we also have another concept known as we also make another concept known as see one person company okay three concepts are there now whenever a partnership firm has to that is commence a business like a partnership is form firm is formed sorry when a sorry when a company is formed they have to get a certificate called certificate of incorporation from whom they have to get the certificate of incorporation from the registrar of companies so certificate of incorporation is nothing other than the birth certificate any individual born in any country they have to get a birth certificate from the statutory authority similarly certificate of incorporation to be obtained for all types of companies public limited company private limited company one person company who issues the certificate of incorporation that is the registrar of companies issues the certificate of incorporation then there is another concept in the company act which was that called as certificate of commencement of business so certificate of incorporation yes the company is that now cause the company has to start a business no how the company will start a business company has to acquire capital how they will acquire capital they will go to market okay somebody will issue, uh, contribute to the capital okay so before commencing the business companies have to get another certificate called certificate of commencement of business so so question number 37 certificate of incorporation to be obtained for all types of companies question number 38 all companies registered on or after 2000 2018 how to obtain certificate of commencement of business in order to ensure that they are not shell companies s h e l l suddenly many companies will come they will get capital from the public and they will disappear isn't it so all companies registered on or after 2/11 2018 has to obtain a certificate called the certificate of commencement of business in order to ensure that they are not shell companies then next question question number 39 a check issued by authorized signatory of a company can be paid even after his death true because the authorized signatory issues the check as per as a representative capacity so question number 39 answer is true who will manage a company under liquidation so the company has that is there's a problem in the company they are not able to meet the debtors they are not able to get the money from the creditors then who will manage the company under liquidation the person appointed by the court who will manage the affairs of the company under liquidation he is called official liquidator he is called official liquidator okay question number 41 a check signed by the authorized signatory a check signed by the authorized signatory of a company can be passed or returned when you come to know that the company is liquidation friends you see question number 39 a check issued by the authorized signatory of a company can be paid even after his death we told here the answer is true a check signed by the authorized signatory of the company can be paid even after his death true because he has signed the check in his representative capacity question number 39 answer is true question number 41 you see here what has happened a check signed by the authorized signatory of the company can be passed or returned when you come to know the company is in liquidation here the authorized signatory has not died what has happened the company has become the company is under liquidation so when the company is in liquidation the check signed by anybody should not be passed because when the company is in liquidation the money belongs to whom the official liquidator so for question number 41 return the check the check signed by the authorized signatory of the company can be passed or returned when you come to know the company is in liquidation you have to return the check question number 42 
the operations in the current account of a private limited company with the two directors one of whom had died shall be discontinued true or false just i will go through the corresponding slide in the powerpoint let us not go through the detailed slides because it is for you to read so i'll i'll, I'll throw trustees also there no issues company see so i told you so uh, that is uh, the maximum director shareholders etc is given here so uh, in the case of a private limited company minimum there should be two directors maximum no ceiling in the case of a public limited company minimum seven seven shareholders no maximum limit number of directors in a public limited company minimum three directors maximum also there is no ceiling in the case of a private limited company minimum two directors in the case of a public limited company minimum three directors maximum here also no ceiling here also no ceiling but if you want more than three in a public limited company a special resolution to be adopted beyond 15 and you can make whatever number you want what is the minimum number of directors in a public limited company two what is the minimum director of directors in a public limited private limited company two public limited company three what is the question let us see the question now question is uh, that is the operations in the current account of a private limited company with the two directors see the minimum number of directors in a private limited company i have shown to you is only two so if out of the two one director has died so the checks coming to the account should not be passed operations in the account to be suspended because the minimum number of directors required for a private limited company is two but only one director is there in such a case the company's existence itself is not there so the question is the operations in the current account of a private limited company with the two directors one of whom died shall be discontinued answer is true because the minimum quorum for a private limited company is required two but one is not there then it has to be suspended operation to be stopped question number 42 answer is true question number 43 the borrowing power of a company is given in dash and the borrowing powers of board of directors is stated in dash see i will give you an example this then you will understand you know you are having in canara bank www.canarabank.com you also have can, can net isn't it so www.canarabank.com is accessible accessible to whom to all staff members as well as to the general public you can access i can access whereas the can net is accessible only to you to the staff members so the www.wcanarabank.com is called an external document whereas this can net is an internal document similarly in a company there are two types of documents memorandum of association and articles of association what is memorandum of association if i log in to www.canarabank.com i will i will come to know what type of loans canara bank will give to an individual what is the maximum loan i can get for example i will come to know for example housing loan an individual in canara bank will give 20 crores whereas in cannet who has power for the 20 crores will be that whether it is rah head or rocac or cocac it be mentioned that so the internal document is cannet so the internal document in company is called articles of association whereas the external document www.canarabank.com in the company it is called the memorandum of association so coming to this point here the borrowing power of a company is given in memorandum of association how much the company can borrow maximum 100 crores the company can borrow how much an individual can get loan from canara bank maximum 20 crores an individual can get like that okay so the question number 43 the borrowing powers of the company is giving in memorandum of association and the borrowing powers of the board of director what your ro can sanction what your rh can sanction that is given in articles of association first to fill up the blanks is memorandum of association the second to fill up the blanks is articles of association question number 44 charge to be registered within how many days of charge creation that is date of documentation in respect of loan to a company as per amendment to companies act 2018 
See, whenever friends, you are giving a loan to your company, you are supposed to see the memorandum of association. You are supposed to see the articles of association, how much the company can borrow. What is the powers of the board of directors to borrow the loan? Okay, that also you have to see. Then after giving a loan to a company, if the, if the properties are in the name of the company, then you have to create a charge with the registrar of companies. Within, within how many days, you have to create a charge with the registrar of companies. Within 30 days from the date of charge creation, you have to register the charge. What is charge creation? Charge creation, the date of your loan. What is charge registration? You are going to the ROC site and registering your charge. Whenever the properties are in the name of the company, loan given against the properties, your charge has to be registered with the registrar of companies within 30 days from the date of charge creation. Okay, here you see, charge to be registered within how many days of charge creation in respect of loan to a company as per amendment to companies act within 30 days. If charge is not registered within 30 days, then within how many days you can register? It can be registered within, that is 60 days from the date of charge creation by paying additional fees. That is, within 30 days, if you are not registering the charge from the date of charge creation, you can register the charge within another 60 days from the date of charge creation. Okay, from the date of loan documents, within 60 days you have to do. Even if you are not doing, even if the charge is not registered within the above stipulated rate, it can be registered within 120 days from the date of charge creation by paying ad valorem fees. I'll just go through the slide. You will get an idea because very, very important. Usually they are giving one example that same, same. Section 77, whose duty is to create the charge? It is a duty of the company to register the charges on the assets in India, outside India, within how many days? Within 30 days of creating charge creation on its assets with the register of companies, with the maximum 211, 2018. What is the maximum number of days charge to be registered? Charge to be registered within 30 days from the date of charge creation. Okay. If it is not done, then you can do yes from the date of creation of charge by paying additional fee. Within 30 days, if you are not doing, within 60 days you pay by paying the by paying the additional fees. Okay, even within 60 days you are not doing. If not done within 60 days, it can be done within 120 days from the date of charge creation with the permission of the registrar by paying ad valorem fees. Friends, if you have forgotten to create a charge within 120 days from the date of your loan papers, then charge cannot be registered at all. If you do not register the charge, then bank will not get the priority over the assets of the company. Okay, so very, very important. Within 120 earlier, 300 days. Beyond 300 days, you can get the government's permission, company law board or government of India permission you can get and you can register the charge. So maximum number of days is only 120 available now. Okay, very, very important. So here, question number 48, let us see. Whose responsibility is to register the charges with respect of loans given to a company? It is a company's responsibility as per section 77 of the Companies Act, which is already made available in the PowerPoint. So question number 49, this question they are asking, very important. So with, with another question, we'll finish today. Uh, the, the, any company's question is there, I will see. Okay, so with question number 50, we'll call it a day today. So question number 49, please apply little mind. Very, very important question. Questions are being asked. Your loan given to your company with the documents date. What do you mean by document date? Date of charge creation. Date of document is known as date of charge creation. Uh, your loan is given to your company with the documents date 2nd January 2019 by Bank A and charge is registered in favor of Bank A on 25th January. You see friends, when loan is given on 2nd January when charge is registered 25th January. So whether within 30 days it is done, yes, 30 days it is done. Okay, within 30 days, law permits you to do. But you see another one. The company executed the documents, that is company has created a charge again, uh, that is with bank B on the same assets on 10th January and obtained a loan. 
on the same assets, company created a charge and obtained loan. Charge is registered in favor of Bank B on 11th January. What happened? You gave a loan on 2nd January and created a charge on 25th January. What the company B did, that is, what the, that is Bank B did, it has given a loan on 10th January when it has created a charge next day, 11th January itself. So both are within 30 days. This is also within 30 days. This is also within 30 days as per law. So here, if the loan becomes NPA, that is, which bank has the priority of charge over the asset? See, here I will give the clarity. When you have to see what is the date of charge creation, what is the date of charge registration? If the date of charge registration is within 30 days from the date of charge creation, this is within the law. Here, both the banks did the charge registration within 30 days from the date of giving loan. Question is, which bank has the priority? When the charge is registered within 30 days, as permitted by the law, then bank which has executed the documents first will get the priority. Here you see, so bank A has done it on 2nd January and charge is created on 25th January. Bank B has done it on 10th January and registered it on 11th January. Even though bank B has registered the charge on 11th January, Bank A has done on 25th January. Since the date of document is 2nd January for Bank A, as compared to Bank B, Bank A will get the charge, first charge. When the date of document, sorry, when the date of registration is within 30 days, bank which has created the charge first, that is bank which has executed the documents first, will get the priority as compared to the other bank. For question number A, 49, the answer is A. Question number 50, so as promised, I'll be concluding. Question number 50, the last point for the day. As amendment to Companies Act 2018, which type of companies to set to get certificate of commencement of business? Friends, I told you there are two types of certificate. Certificate of incorporation. Certificate of incorporation will be issued by the registrar of companies. It is applicable for all types of companies. It is like a birth certificate. Certificate of commencement of business. Whichever company is issuing shares in the market, so those companies has to get a certificate of commencement from the registrar of companies to ensure that they are not shell companies. So, as per amendment to Companies Act in November 2018, which types of companies to get certificate of commencement of business? Private limited company, public limited company, one company, all companies having share capital. Question number 50, the answer is D. Okay, friends, we will stop it for the day and we will have meet again tomorrow, maybe in the remaining 50 questions in the one hour available to you. Tomorrow we will finish. Okay, another question? Yes, sir. Okay. Anything you want, you have to announce that. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you for giving a three hour session with uh, the We will have the next, next session, session tomorrow, 8 p.m. as that would. I will be sharing the link tomorrow morning. Many, Many people have asked, asked to join us in the link. Room. So, uh, maximum, maximum possible, I will share the link. link. Remaining, for remaining people, people also, we will share the link. link. We will also upload the, that is, uh, share the question papers and PowerPoint presentations so far discussed in the group so that I need not uh, share one by one separately. So kindly excuse us. We will share the remaining PowerPoint and the video links. Everything will be shared in the email. Thank, Thank you, sir. So we wind, wind up the session for the day. We will add as much as possible all the people in this group. I am sending the uh, WhatsApp link for everybody to join the group. For remaining people, 
we will form another group also if it is not uh, if the group exceeds the limit we will form another group also for exclusively people who are attending this session thank, thank you. you thank, thank you, you for joining us